Uh, I think at this time, at this point, we should really open it up to the floor. Um, it's a very ambitious and accomplished film. Well done. Terrific. But well, I just wanted to know, what experience did you have in making films before you started this? Written two plays. I'd been to drama school, went to Lambda. Uh, I could never get a job as an actor. Uh, I actually did get one job. It was a spin-off of The Bill. It wasn't even The Bill. It was something called Burnside. And I was in episode four, Trial by Fire. And uh, I played a Turkish drug dealer, of all things. And I was killed in the opening credits. And I had my mouth taped. And I was shot in the back of a car and set on fire. And I very excitedly communicated to my family that I'd got my first break and of course, you know, they were devastated that I'd been to drama school and become an actor. My father had just escaped 2,000 years of poverty, had come to this country and now his son was going to become an actor, not a lawyer or an accountant and uh, I, had to, I had to tell them to watch Burnside at, at 8 o'clock uh, on a Wednesday night. It didn't go down well but, um, but, but then I I had a couple of plays as well in London. Uh, again, disastrous in some respects. Uh, I think that Sunday Express gave my first play zero stars. Uh, and the critic there said he'd never given zero stars before. So that was uh, quite an interesting experience. But it was the Sunday Express. Um, and then I kind of... Uh, so I guess it was a badge of honour. Um, so I then decided to go to film school because someone had suggested what I was writing for the stage were in fact film scripts. And it made sense. I was writing lots of short scenes. So I went to and did a part-time film course. Uh, Sarah Butler here actually works for a company in a building that my brother and I own. And part of the rent, Sarah is a very experienced TV uh, production, um, manager, line producer, and part of the rent for three months was Sarah was going to produce my short film when I was at film school. And, you know, the budget normally for film school shorts is about 500 quid, but we, this just escalated. And, uh, <laughs> and um, but it was such a, I didn't want to direct it, did genuinely didn't want to direct it, and, because uh, I thought I'd just be a writer, I'm just a writer, and, uh, but the film school said, you've got to do it. And I did it, and I enjoyed it. It was a brilliant two days. And I thought, I'm going to do this again. So that's how it happened, those kind of stages. You, I think uh, rejection, it can be a great thing. You, it just forces you to move on. I, thought, I, I just thought I was going to be an actor. Uh, and, and I have a little part in here. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, and, and I had to fight to keep that part because Sarah had got uh, ITN to supply a free real journalist and she came to me like a week before shooting and said you don't need to do the newsreader we've got someone and I my whole world crumpled <laughs> I thought I'm just about to spend a million quid I've got my first part and I, and I, I genuinely had to fight Sarah to keep myself in my own film uh, you're great <laughs> Anybody else? This lady here. Check, by large, yes. We had to increase it a little bit. There was costs to films that you don't appreciate until after you finish, especially post production. So in Greece, they wanted 35mm prints. What you've seen this on is digital DCP. Uh, and just creating a 35mm print just for the Greek distributor uh, cost like £40,000. Or forty thousand pounds, and there are, so these little additional costs in terms of the actual budget of making the film. We were Sarah is unbelievably brilliant at managing a budget. It, if it wasn't for that management of a budget, we just couldn't have done it. I can tell you, I'm very honest. It was it was nine hundred thousand pounds. looks like it costs a lot more than that. I, I, I know £900,000 is a huge amount of money, but it looks like a much more expensive film. Yeah, but in part, that's down to the actors not 
demanding the bigger fees as well. And we found a group of beautiful, lovely actors who believed in the story. And so they need to be applauded. I wish there were more actors like that in the world. There's a lady right at the back there. Had I intended to cast a father and son, no, this is a really lovely story. We went straight for Uncle Spiros here as our first. In fact, Jimmy, who's standing next to Uncle Spiros, Jimmy Rusunis, he's been, I've known him for many years. We met on the set of another TV show that I had got into as policeman number four. <laughs> Jimmy, what police number were you? Police, police. He was Jimmy. Jimmy was police number three. It was, uh, it was, it was like a drama set in, in. It was about the British plane spotters that had been arrested in in Greece uh, for plane spotting, and they I, they got every single Greek actor in London to be in it. So, um, and uh, Jimmy had when he knew about this project, um, he's been supplying me with brilliant information. He told me to go read. Um, Sidney Lumet's book, which I did, and he was constantly feeding me with info. And he said, "Gotta get George Korofas." And uh, to my uh, shame, I didn't really know who George was. Uh, so I went onto YouTube, and I saw a clip of George on YouTube messing. I'd seen a couple of clips of him acting, and I think there was the third clip: George messing around on set, playing a practical joke. It was like an outtake. And there and then, I thought, that is Uncle Spiros. I want someone that is playing practical jokes between takes. And so we made Uncle Spiros our number one target. Then that freed us up to cast a non-Greek as Harry. And there are some brilliant British actors. One of them uh, was Stephen Delane. And when someone suggests Stephen Delane, you just say yes. Yeah, we'll work out how we can make him look Greek. But you say, yes, he's such a fine, brilliant actor. But he was committed to Game of Thrones, which is this big, huge TV show. And it didn't look like we were going to get him. And in my research, I, we come across his son, Frank. And it's straight away, he looked Greek. So we decided to get Frank in for a casting. And he was so brilliant it blew us away completely staring there and we went we want it and that's how we cast i mean cosimo i think was the third actress we'd seen and i knew there and then that was sophie and i didn't want to see anybody else and i'm not one of these people that says oh i'm not sure let's see another one i just thought that's the one and the same with frank we thought that is the one and so and george savides straight away i knew he was the man for Hassan, and so um, um, then when we offered Frank Delane the part, Frank is still at RADA, he's, he's in Harry Potter as the young Voldemort, and we offered Frank the part before his dad. And I think that made Stephen ask whether he wanted to work with his son or not, and I think he loved the idea. He then got Game of Thrones to move their schedule for us, which was something I never imagined would happen. And it, it just was a dream opportunity for us to have a real father and son play father and son, and the two Delanes. And both their acting styles are very different, which is fascinating to watch. And there's... Pardon? Yeah, actually, I want... Tommy, no, we saw, we, saw, actually, I... we saw a few Tommies, but we saw two before, but... But straight away, uh, Theo, when Tommy walked in, I knew that was, was Theo Papadopoulos. And he was just so brilliant and professional. I, I genuinely believe he worked harder than anyone else. He really was so dedicated. He was so unbelievable. I just didn't, I didn't have to give Tommy notes. He was just on it. And I'm not joking. He was just on it. I, I think one of my favourite scenes is when... Uh, you're in the bedroom, you're making him laugh, and then the other kids come in. It's just just brilliant, brilliant scene, lovely, lovely from both of you. Lady in the middle here. Right here. Uh, yes, they have. Yeah, for those of you who didn't hear, are Marcus's parents proud of him? Have they seen the film? Yes and yes. My father uh, had his gardener, Peter the gardener, 
handing out flyers outside <laughs> City World Birmingham. <laughs> How long was the shoot and what format did we shoot on? Uh, the shoot was 24 days. Two days of that was general views. One day of that was riots. So uh, that, uh, and we shot on an Ari Alexa. Um, and Seb, who's the editor, second from there, was brilliant because, you know, he, I, I, we, I'm the first time director this just technically, that I just, can't know stuff. Seb is a really experienced editor, so it was wonderful to have somebody pick up some of the shots that I just dropped along the way, uh, and I, I, you know, I didn't have a problem with that. It's just, just that's your first film, so without Seb, we couldn't have just picked up some of the shots that I dropped. But it was the first week that was the tough one. Then after that, we found a rhythm, and Seb was great. First weekend, Sarah's going to take over. Sorry. I think it's worth noting as well and commending Marcus that on his first feature it was basically an ensemble cast. So there was never any two-handers, just two actors in scenes. He was needing to shoot on, you know, six, eight, ten actors at once. And as a first-time director on a very, very tight schedule, that was very well done. <laughs> and, and, and that's because of Anna Brabins at the end as well. Anna's the first assistant director. First assistant director really is managing the set. And we... We just, we, we've had a tough first week, but then we found the rhythm. If I ever got to make another film, I would always want to work with these people because they really did support me uh, in a way that I couldn't have imagined, and I'm so grateful for that. Can I just save the next question and just say it myself? You're going to make another film, aren't you? Tr truly, I don't know, because I, I, the way this film is being distributed seems to me like probably bigger than the actual film itself, I think. Because there are a lot of stories like Papadopoulos and Sons flying around. There's a lot of scripts like Papadopoulos and Sons. They never get made. I've seen them. They've passed my desk at the back. <laughs> Was it Thor, you sort of taught the cast how to, how to do that? Or? The, who taught us to Greek dance? We... We, I, there was a f Greek film called My Daughter the Socialist, and I loved the, the Zambetis piece, and I loved the, the whole, the whole, that moment in that film, and I wanted to recreate this. And I approached uh, a choreographer who was my dance teacher at Lambda called Jack Murphy, who was very nervous about doing a Greek piece. Uh, brilliant man, and we brought in uh, a lot, but he he understood the spirit of what that dance had to do. It didn't have to be perfect, a bit rough, a bit a, not technically right. This is a man that hasn't danced in years. He's still very British, a bit rusty, and he has he has to find his way back into the dance. And he Jack completely understood that. And uh, Kate, we looked at this piece from my daughter, the socialist, and he came up with this plan and we got some Hele some dancers from the Hellenic Center who are in here. They are, they exist, they're in this room. Uh, there's two there that I can see. And they came and added something quite beautiful to that scene. We spent a whole day shooting that, didn't we? And Seb, how long did you take to... Seb, tell us about editing that scene. Because it was unreal. The first thing I wanted to say about that scene was that um, I was sat in the chip shop in, behind a monitor, next to a monitor, uh, and it really was truly one of the most singly exciting moments I've spent anywhere near a film set, when they all went flying past, and we all had to wait until the camera had shouted, till, till this lady had shouted cut, so we could go out and start cheering, because it was, it was truly breathtaking, that first take. Putting it together was a mission. <laughs> it, was a, it, it was a challenge. And a mission. Um, but being there on the day helped hugely. Um, a lot of people have said there was a lot of passion um, in that crowd of people. Um, and that kind of makes your job easy because when there's joy on people's faces, your emotion is taken away. So you can actually, if you watch the sequence closely, as I have microscopically, um, there are some things in there that I know in terms of continuity are really, really not right. But the emotion of it flows so beautifully. And that's what we went for. 
and um, and I certainly feel I certainly felt I haven't seen it for a long time. It was exciting to yeah. watch it tonight in so many ways, yeah. um, and I certainly felt that 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 essence was completely captured, and and really beautiful and fun and just lovely. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed doing it. I mean, with regard, if you don't mind me asking, to the distribution, how on earth did you manage to get it onto this screen and around the country? A service theatrical deal is when you split your film in for one week in some cinemas so you can end up doing the DVD deal. But I was ambitious and I, I, I nagged Cineworld to give me this site, I nagged them to give me other sites and I showed them a business plan that I could make it work uh, by using social media and to Cineworld's credit they gave me the chance uh, and so they gave me the opportunity uh, and because I'd shown them a plan, a social media plan, it was like a five-page document of all the Greek churches that I was going to cold call. We were cold calling Greek Orthodox priests three weeks ago. And some of them are interested in investing in the next film. Uh, <laughs> I kid you not. Uh, we, I tweeted every single fish and chip shop owner in Britain that I could find on Twitter. You know, um, the Codfather in Burton, uh, and we we just we we went for strands. We're like, what else can we do to get the word out? Obviously, Facebook as well, and getting flyers and posters out to the community. And there's a lovely woman in Manchester called Auntie Penny, who is not my auntie, and I've never met her, but she emails me every day, telling me that she's praying for me and the film. She's an elderly Greek lady, and who she's flying around Manchester. So it's without people like Auntie Penny, uh, we, we just wouldn't have you in here as well. You are here, which is great. This lady here. Uh, For those of you that didn't hear, the question is, what did Boy George do? Bo Boy George. He is a big fan of the film. He knows a guy called John Themis. I don't know if John's in here tonight. Uh, <laughs> John Themis is the bazooki player uh, on the soundtrack, and John is a lovely guy. He really believes in this film. We, he, when we came to make the music, John was kind of hovering around at the back and kind of came over. He's a, he's a character, and he said, uh, so what's this about? And I said, you know, it's about a Greek, rich Greek businessman who loses living in a banking crisis and ends up in a chip shop. And he straight away went, this is going to be massive. <laughs> and he knows... Boy George, and so he brought Boy George along. Boy George has been tweeting. He's a fan. He's like an early celebrity fan of the film. He's been incredibly supportive, uh, along with John. Uh, they work a lot together, so that was the connection. I know you had a second question. Yeah, the second one was, um, how did you get Ed Silver? Was it because you worked with Stephen, or was it Ed and I were at <laughs> Lambda together? So we, we actually shared the lead in the final year show. Uh, I played the first act uh, of a play called The Suicide by Nikolai Erdman. Ed played the second. I was much better. <laughs> but Ed went on to work with Roman Polanski, and I went on to Burnside. <laughs> he could never have played that part, Marcus. Ed Stoffard could never have played that Turkish drug dealer. This lady here, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's the biggest challenge you've had as a director? The biggest the, challenge the film? is time. You've got a small budget and a limited amount of time, and you've got to try and get everything you want in the, your shooting schedule. Because we were working with Anna and Sarah Butler, we were able to do it. And you have a shot list. Uh, but you've got your preferred, sh you've got your must-have shots that you've got to get. Then you have your nice-to-haves. And... It's, I, I, we rarely went into the nice-to-haves. You know, you, we just about got the must-haves. And the time is always ticking. You, time is always ticking. And what you want is it in the second or third take, you want it so you can move on to your next position. And that is the singularly, when you're on a low budget, it might be with a big budget as well, I suspect it is, that actually there's never enough time to get everything that you want. It's just one of those things. But yeah, it's, it's the hardest thing is to try and get, get the story told in the time that you have. And there was a lady somewhere in the middle. Yes, Steph. 
Would I make the second film about the priest? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that would be quite something. Yeah, he was uh, done for making illegal copies of Rambo. Now he owns three three liquor stores in Palmer's Green. That's a good story. Surely there's a spin-off there, isn't yeah. there? I think. Yeah, uh, I think this is going to be the last question. This chap right here. Tommy, how did you feel the experience and do you want to carry on acting? It was, it was absolutely amazing. It was really, really incredible. Everyone was so nice. Um, like, so nice. I, um, and it, it was a really friendly atmosphere. Like, as, um, uh, sorry, I completely forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> um, uh, do I want to carry on acting? Um, I don't, I don't, think so, nothing to do with this film. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, I don't, I don't think, um, I'm in a very lucky position to say that I, I don't think it's probably for me, but I really, really enjoyed this, this experience, this film, it was absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. It's a good note to finish on. Uh, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I, I know you'd want to join with me in thanking so many members of the cast and crew for coming tonight. Also, a big thank you to Marcus for making the film. We've all enjoyed so much. But mainly, thank you to you for coming. Tell all your friends.